Hello, Stephen here, wishing you all a Merry Christmas and a good new year when it comes. I thought that quite a few of you might be wanting to get out and stargaze, or maybe you'll be getting a new telescope or new binoculars over the festive season. I thought, therefore, you might like a little overview of what you might be able to see over the festive period. So let's just get straight into it. Uh, we're currently looking at skies on Christmas Eve and the time is 4.30 p.m. and I wanted to draw your attention to this time because over here in the southwest you can see the glow of the setting sun and there are a number of planets that you might be able to see round about that time and that will include Christmas Day, Boxing Day and so on. So as the sun sets, if you have good horizons, look to the south, southwest and you may be able to see, see the incredibly bright planet Venus. And if you sight Venus, it will be unmistakable. It will be pretty much the brightest object you can see in the sky, barring the sun and the moon. Um, it shines at an incredibly bright magnitude um, simply because it has highly reflective clouds. Um, and it's relatively close to us and about the same size as Earth. All the, those factors make Venus an incredibly bright object to view. Um, now you will need a low horizon to the southwest. If you have lots of buildings nearby or trees, try and find a better vantage. Moving a little bit higher and easier to see, however, will be Saturn. Uh, now when it's kind of twilight like, the, like this, t Saturn will be hard to see naked eye. As it gets darker, it will become more visible. However, much easier to see will be the planet Jupiter. Uh, which will shine not quite as brightly as Venus, but it will probably be the most obvious target um, or planet that most of you will be able to access due to the conditions and its elevation. And even as we get into early and mid-evening, uh, you'll still be able to see Jupiter shining pretty brightly. Well worth training your telescope, incidentally, on Saturn or Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter, you can see the main bright Galilean moons even in a pair of binoculars. Let's just pan in to see uh, the configuration of the moons at this specific point in time. So again this is 4.30 p.m. Christmas Eve but uh, if you become a seasoned viewer of the moons of Jupiter you'll know that these change quite rapidly. You can almost watch them clockwork uh, rotating around the planet Jupiter. So you really need to check your sky charts and astronomy apps to see what you're looking at in terms of those bright pins of pinpoints of light. So let's move out now and advance time. So bear with me while I count through the hours for you. So Christmas Eve still 4.30, 5.30 p.m. Starting to get dark now. Venus almost set 6 p.m. Uh, now Venus set, only Jupiter remains up in the southwest if you're planet hunting. Oh sorry, Saturn as well, but very low. Now let's pan around to see what starts to become visible at 6.30. It's pretty much dark now and if we swing around to the east we see the unmistakable um, figure of Orion starting to rise. And actually, this is one of my favourite parts of the night sky in winter. Let me just advance time a little bit further. Um, so maybe you're having your dinner. Uh, let's go to 7.30 and perhaps 8.30. That might be the sort of time uh, when you might be coming out to stargaze with your new equipment. So over in the southeast now, you'll see Orion with its unmistakable belt stars. That linear arrangement of massive stars. And on the top left, we have Betelgeuse, the red supergiant. Betelgeuse, incidentally, means armpit of the Great One. And Rigel, bottom right, foot of the Great One. And many people saw Orion as a hunter, male hunter figure um, across the planet, different cultures. Kind of saw the same thing. And if we look um, above Orion, he is fighting the bull. So we have the hunter with his shield, his weapon, fighting the celestial bull, Taurus. Um, Taurus is a fairly um, easy constellation to pick out. If you look for the little V of stars with the red 
giant star Aldebaran in the center here. Now this is a nice binocular target. So if you've got a new pair of binoculars, have a look here. This is the Hyades open star cluster. And it's not quite as spectacular as the Pleiades, but I like it because Aldebaran is sort of in the foreground here. Aldebaran, I believe, is only about 70 light years away. Most of the stars in the Hyades are much further away, a couple of hundred light years perhaps. Um, so Aldebaran is not connected to that open star cluster, but nonetheless, it's a lovely thing to look at. Another thing to look out for in Taurus are the two horns of the bull. And the Crab supernova uh, remnant is over in this horn, but you'll need a telescope for that and very dark skies. Now, moving up um, from Taurus, so remember, in a way, we're making a line here through the belt stars. So if we go up through the belt stars, we get to all these interesting objects. We eventually get to the Pleiades open star cluster. Now, um, my recommendation is to look at the Pleiades in binoculars. Um, many people excitedly look at the Pleiades in a telescope. The problem is the Pleiades are distributed over quite a wide area of sky and in a telescope you might just tend to sort of get a field like this where all you're seeing is very bright stars. Um, there's not a great deal of sort of contrast to appreciate the cluster uh, at that sort of magnification. However, in a pair of binoculars you're going to come out to see something maybe a little bit more like that so you'll appreciate the sort of jewel box of stars and of course the Pleiades, probably the most famous open star cluster in the night sky. Um, in Japanese it is called Subaru, which means come together. Um, and going back um, to record into the, the furthest reaches of recorded history, there have been mentionings of this star cluster. And of course it being on the ecliptic, the sun, the moon, um, and some of the planets will pass close to it. So there we go. Um, that's one of the best areas to look at. If you wait a little bit longer, so remember this is 8.30, let's go to 9.30, 10.30. So remember this is kind of Christmas Eve, Christmas. Um, very little difference between the two evenings. We now have the brightest star in the, right sky, the, the night sky having risen behind Orion. So we follow the belt stars back to get to Sirius. And Sirius is so bright because it's very close to us. Um, it's only maybe a dozen light years away, perhaps less. Um, but Sirius means scorching. Um, that's what the Greeks uh, um, kind of called it. They thought it was a second sun and it provided heat to the summer because when they used to cite it in the classical era of Greek antiquity, um, it would rise just ahead of the sun uh, round about the start of summer, it would heliacally rise in front of the sun and they thought therefore it added to the heat of the sun. Uh, however, Sirius, as I said before, it's not a particularly giant star. It is bigger than our sun, but it's so bright because of its proximity. And to the left and above we have Procyon or Procyon and this star means before the dog because Sirius is in the constellation of the dog Canis Major. And between these two stars is the Milky Way. Now, this is the kind of less vibrant portion of the Milky Way in the direction of Orion. If you want to see the brighter region, you actually need to pan around towards the northwest. And in this region, we have um, Cygnus, the swan, um, although that part of the Milky Way is kind of starting to set now. Um, but that's certainly the area looking into the galactic disk and Vega um, is still up at this time of year, although again, as I say, it's rapidly losing elevation. So let me just go back. Um, I wanted to also point out, and again, we're still Christmas Eve, remember, that the moon um, is waning gibbous and it rises in Leo. So again, once it reaches 10.30 p.m., 11 p.m., 30 p.m. perhaps it's not that clear but there are patches of clearness you've got a new telescope you're itching to use it well there's nothing better than observing the moon in a telescope um, an astonishing object to look at underappreciated I think by astronomers 
amateur and professional alike. I love looking at it um, and it's a really good test of your new telescope. Uh, loads of lovely things to see on the moon. Um, there's going to be a clear terminator due to the waning gibbous nature of the moon. Get yourself a good moon atlas or look it up and start to familiarise yourself with these amazing craters and scars of the violent formation of the solar system, which is always how I like to think about the moon. It's like a relic of uh, the, the accretion and formation of our planets in our solar system. So, um, there we go. Uh, that's taken us up to 10.30pm and the same for Christmas Day. So let's now wheel round to the north. Um, and here we go. I just want to go back a little bit. We're quite late now. Let's go back to a slightly more sociable hour. Back to 8.30pm on Christmas Eve again, or Christmas Day. And we're looking north now and we can see the unmistakable profile of the plough, which again is an asterism, not a constellation. Uh, the Americans call this the Big Dipper, the French call it La Casserole, the ancient Mayans called it Seven Star Macaw, and so on. It is part of Urza Major, the Greater Bear, and I just wanted to highlight the fact that it's going to kind of be in its correct um, right side up configuration, if you imagine it being like a frying pan or something, slightly rotated to the left. But let's quickly remind ourselves how do we get to Polaris? We follow the two pointer stars on the right of the pan and there is Polaris. One thing to look out for naked eye and in your binoculars is the lovely double star in the second star along the handle, Mizor and Alcor. Here I'm going to zoom in here. This is the horse and rider. Um, in binoculars you'll see um, these two stars clearly split into a binary pair, they are a binary pair, uh, the consensus is now. Uh, we, we didn't used to know that, but I believe they're about three quarters of a light year away, these stars, and they are gravitationally bound, the latest research suggests. Naked eye, if you have 20-20 vision, you should see these two stars just split into a double, and that used to be an eyesight test going way back into antiquity. So there we go, there is um, the plough. If you follow the other two stars in the pan, the leftmost stars, you make a little curve over to Vega. So again, this is more stargazing for you, but nonetheless useful. Okay, so let's just recenter on Orion. Um, what if you have a new telescope with a big aperture and you want to look at some dark sky objects or deep sky objects? So what would be my recommendations? Um, well, uh, one of the best objects to look at is the Andromeda Galaxy. So I want to try to um, help you find that. So if we pan back to the southwest, um, the stars to look out for are a square of stars that you will see called the Great Square of Pegasus. And at the moment, they're going to be in the southwest at around 8.30 p.m. This is 8.30 p.m. at the moment. Once you have found those four stars, try to find three bright stars in a curve emerging from the square. And this is actually the figure of Andromeda lying across the night sky. And there are three stars here. The middle brightish one is Mirac. And if you then kind of star hop to this next star along and then kind of the same distance again, you will get to Andromeda. So let me just show you that. You can now see the glow of Andromeda. So you start at Mirac, pretend you're star hopping two stars, one hop to this bright star in Andromeda and then another equal distance and you will get to Andromeda. Now, naked eye, you would have to be under a dark sky to see it, but in binoculars, you should should see a kind of lantern-like glow from that region. And in a telescope, um, depending on the magnification, I'd recommend a wide field, like a 32mm or 25mm eyepiece for observing Andromeda. 
you will actually see the bright core, but it will not quite look this amazing. Uh, you would need a very big telescope to see it in this detail. But nonetheless, the thrill of looking at Andromeda is to appreciate that you are looking at an extra um, galactic or um, island universe, um, a totally independent galaxy like our Milky Way that is two and a half million light years away. That figure always is always astonishes me to think that the light from that object emerged all that time ago um, before modern humans were on the planet. You're looking back at ancient starlight here uh, but you're looking at a vast storm of stars of similar or if not greater magnitude to our Milky Way galaxy and I always like to imagine if there are intelligent beings on some humdrum planet on an insignificant star looking out with their telescopes, they would probably see our Andromeda galaxy in a similar fashion, as a kind of ellipse of light. So there we go, that is Andromeda, a brilliant deep sky object to look out for. Um, so there is a little tip um, and a good target for your telescopes. There's lots more I could highlight, but I think that will be it for the moment. Just to finish the video then, um, let's go to New Year. Now obviously the skies are changing, you know, reasonably slowly. Uh, so let me, bear with me while I advance time. So the 24th of December, the 25th, the 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st of December. And here we are in New Year. And what you will have appreciated is that um, the stars are slowly proceeding um, uh, to rise in the east. Uh, so Orion now is higher and Sirius will now be visible earlier in the evening. But apart from that, the nature of the night sky is not changing appreciably over that period. Um, let's have a look at what the planets will look like on New Year's Day. So let me go back to 4.30 p.m. again. 6 p.m., 5.30 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. And again, uh, not that different. You still have opportunities to see Venus. In fact, Mercury is also um, kind of parallel with Venus in the, in the um, evening or twilight sky. That's well worth looking for Mercury. Quite difficult to see for the most part. It's now a new moon as well, so great for Milky Way observing and also opportunities to see Saturn and Jupiter. So let me just advance time again and go back to kind of 8.30 or so on New Year's Day. So there we are at 8.30 and this would be a great time to view the Milky Way um, and I would recommend to look towards the north west to west and look in the direction of Vega and Cygnus the Swan or the Northern Cross. This constellation here marks uh, this bright area of the Milky Way. Well worth looking at. Uh, Vega itself is a lovely star. It's about 25 light years away. It means swooping hawk. Um, this is the constellation Lyra or the Harp of Orpheus. Now, one more object that uh, dark sky or deep sky fans might want to look out for is something called the Ring Nebula. Now, let me zoom out and show you how to get to that. If you can find Vega and the diamond shape of stars in the sky in between, practically bang in between these two bright stars at the bottom of the diamond is the Ring Nebula. And I'm going to zoom in. The Ring Nebula, of course, is the ghostly remnants of a dead star, a star actually of similar um, stellar um, magnitude um, as our Sun. So Sun-like stars, um, like our own star, when they die, they will compress into a white dwarf at the centre and the outer atmosphere, having gone through the red giant phase, will kind of dissipate out into space and the ionization of the gases will produce this lovely halo effect. Now um, again you need to take a picture, um, long exposure to see colors. In a telescope you might see something that looks like a smoke ring. 
So don't expect too much, but it is a really nice target to test your new telescope on. So there we go. I think I'm going to end the video there. I actually wanted to talk a little bit less than that, uh, but I always get carried away when I'm speaking about the stars. Uh, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this quick video. Um, I really hope you have a wonderful Christmas and New Year, and I hope you get some clear skies. Thank you very much for listening and watching.